a little, little different, but um, we're at two o'clock. So I think it's time to, to get started. So uh, see everybody that's, uh, that's joined. We appreciate you very much. We're going to have a fantastic session today with Jill. And I uh, appreciate you very much taking time uh, out of your day to, to join us today. Um, we're going to have a fantastic Fantastic discussion, mostly led by by Jill, uh, and I just want to welcome her and welcome you for uh, for this session. I, we hope that you're going to learn something, maybe come away with one or two ideas that will just help you to have a conversation uh, or have some tools, perhaps that might get you uh, to to a further part in your journey uh, with uh, an, an an elderly parent or whoever it may be that, that you're helping. So uh, we're we're really looking forward to this. Uh, our presenter today is Jill Gaffner Livingston. Uh, who I've known for many, many years now. Um, she is a certified dementia practitioner and uh, has a very compelling personal story. And uh, I can tell you on a personal level, she has helped our family with uh, some struggles that we've had uh, in this area. So she's a, a tremendous resource and trains lots of people. She's an author of, a, of a, a book on personal positioning for the caregiver and has a very successful training company that helps train other people in how to work with seniors and dealing with dementia and other situations like that. So we're very fortunate to have uh, her and her experience here uh, to join us today. Um, this webinar is sponsored by Medical Care Alert. We're a national provider of medical alert systems, uh, and we're here to help you perhaps with your journey. Uh, if we can help someone to live independently uh, and with a little bit more peace of mind for themselves and for the family, then, then we've certainly done our job. And uh, you know, it's just that ability to, to get somebody that, that help that they might need in an emergency or to know that if they're left alone, that, that they can get help uh, is something that gives a lot of comfort to, to the families. And we service thousands of families around the country. Um, I won't go into the details of it, but we have systems for just about every need, whether it's just something that works in your home, whether it's something with GPS tracking, or if it's actually a smartwatch uh, that can do things like track steps and also call for emergency help. We've got uh, probably something for everybody that will uh, be affordable and also uh, to help get, as I said, everyone peace of mind. Uh, and you can find all that on our website at www.medicalcarealert.com. And if you use promo code Jill, promo code Jill will get you 10% off. So uh, if you're if you're a new client with us, we uh, we hope to welcome you to the family. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn the presenting uh, duties over to Jill. Uh, and we're again very excited to have have her with us today. Um, Jill, can you take over posting duties or do I need to I can. Turn it over to you? Yep, if you send me over as the host, I will take care of it. I think you have hosting capabilities. I think you're good to go. Uh, you have to stop sharing. I have to stop sharing. Normally I'm, I'm a good sharer, I have to okay. share. Okay, there you go. So I want to welcome everyone here to this webinar. And certainly I want to thank Medical Care Alert uh, and Brian in particular for bringing up this subject and, uh, and inviting me because this is uh, one of the hottest subjects probably that I speak on. So Brian mentioned some of my credentials and that I own a training company. And for the last 18 years, I have spent my 100% of time uh, supporting caregivers. As a matter of fact, probably more than my credentials, uh, I'm probably more known as being the voice of, of the caregiver. And one of the subjects that has come up in the last several years has been this delicate discussion. And this makes perfect sense because we are at a time where we, we have what they call a silver tsunami, right? We have these waves of seniors. As a matter of fact, we have the largest senior population ever recorded in US history, right? So we have baby boomers and I'm kind of on the cusp of that. And baby boomers have been making their way through, uh, you know, year after year after year, being a great uh, voice uh, when it came to things like music and fashion, politics, and so forth. Baby boomers were prone to age, and about to eight, nine years ago, we started seeing the first of the baby boomers process through the aging cycle. Back in 2011, then President Obama, he noticed it also, right? Obviously, people knew this age group was coming and the size of it. And he went to every state and every territory and said, you better have a plan for your seniors. Like you, people can't just age and not have a plan. 
So it was back in 2011 that you started seeing a change in maybe in your hometown. Maybe you saw more senior centers or a more independent living or maybe memory care units. And so people started to prepare for the baby boomers. For me, I became a caregiver far before I became a boomer. And uh, though my story started years ago, I was, I was married uh, early, I was only 22. And by the time I was 32 and uh, we had two children, my husband was diagnosed with double lung cancer, followed by brain cancer, followed by strokes and seizures and early onset dementia. Though his life expectancy was very short, like they really didn't expect him to see 12 months, he ended up living 21 years. So 21 years with all of these changes in uh, physically, but, but also cognitively, and the decisions that we had to make along the way, back then we didn't have the resources, right? We didn't have the baby boomer information or, or for that matter, the technology. And so there are a lot of decisions that were made uh, through trial and error. My hope today is to give some information to all of you so that you can have it and then you can share it with people that you know and extended family members and the care team for you and, and your, your patient, your person, your loved one, so that perhaps you can avoid maybe some of the mistakes that, that I made. So like I said, this is a great time to, to have this conversation because we are in a position where we do have so many seniors and of record, we have something like 65 million caregivers and caregivers, you know, the definition of a caregiver and the instruction guide that we get, which, you know, that's kind of a tongue in cheek joke. We don't really get an instruction guide. We just do our best day to day, making decisions to the best of our ability to take care of our person so that they are safe and kept as happy as possible. So before we start the presentation, let's just think about things that we already know, right? So one, we know that we have, like I said, a large population of people that will process from now until 2030, right? That's the, the life expectancy or the age for the boomers. We also know through uh, information provided to us, of some of the fears of people who are 65 and older. So general fears of someone who is aging, uh, one is loss of independence. The second thing we know is that they fear declining of their own health. They fear running out of money. They fear not living, not being able to live at home. They fear the death of a loved one, particularly a spouse. They fear the inability to manage their activities, not being able to drive, their fear of loneliness, maybe isolation. They fear strangers taking care of them, maybe even touching them in order to take care of them. And they fear falling, right? So we already know going in before a conversation that those are the top 10 fears of people 65 and older. By the way, all of you, are able to have this presentation if you want it. All we ask you to do is to request it because not everyone on this webinar may want a, a copy of this presentation, but if you do, it's yours. Just send an email saying, please send me the information, the presentation and send it straight to sales at medicalcarealert.com. Right, so that's sales at medicalcarealert.com and you will receive a copy of the presentation that I'm gonna share with you right now. So I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, well, Brian. <laughs> uh, we need to see if uh, Brian, yes. what's going if on? You're on. What's your name? Yeah, I need I'm you on. to make me the host, please. Okay. Thank you.
Done. There we go. All right, thank you. Okay, yep. so now I can share my screen. So here we go. So in my uh, presentation, in the beginning, what we're gonna look at here is the beginning, right? Finding the right time. This is hard to do because as a caregiver, even through my situation with my husband, Bob, uh, there was the right time and the right place. And I didn't always use the right time and the right place. Quite honestly, I probably started more of an emotional uh, discussion. And that's the one thing we want to avoid. Of course, ideally, we should be having a conversation with our person, whether it's a loved one, spouse, or friend, whomever, uh, before the time is needed and gather this information. So perhaps this is the time for you to have a delicate discussion uh, you know, with your loved ones about your future. But what we wanna do is we wanna kind of keep it hypothetical. When the time comes to talk to our aging uh, person, our senior, about their long-term care, we might, instead of wanting to direct the conversation to them, maybe make it hypothetical, right? So we could say, if you're talking to a spouse, oh, sweetheart, you know, let's take a minute and just share to each other uh, that what would we want if maybe someday uh, our health situation turned out like, you know, your friend Sherry, what would you want? Right, so kind of make it hype, uh, a, a little bit more about Sherry, but we learn more about it. What we're trying to do is not make an emotional decision. Right? And I think most caregivers probably can connect with me when we say, you know, there are times that we go, see, see what I mean? This is why you shouldn't be living here. Or do you see what you just did? And all of that starts pointing the finger where people could start getting, to the point where they don't want to share, right? They kind of shut down. In a good conversation, while it's flowing and you gather information, keep going. But if you get to a point where there's too much emotion on either side, right? You're getting emotional as the person starting the conversation or your senior is getting emotional, back off the conversation. This is not a one-time conversation. This typically takes uh, several conversations to get the information. One of the things that we want to do is make sure we understand what they want, right? We can't really identify unless we have this, this conversation, what they want based on others, because everybody's an individual and there is just no right program for everybody. So the goal is to understand what they want and how can we help to get them to the point where they are healthy, they are secure, they are safe, and the plan resembles something that they want, if possible. One of the methods that I encourage people to use is called the validation method. So validation method, uh, there was a lady by the name of Naomi Feil, F-E-I-L, and Naomi is a, a senior herself. And she introduced this validation. She said, oftentimes when people become seniors and as they age, we no longer validate. It's almost like we step in and we just assume that we know what they want or that we know better, or maybe we just don't want to tolerate the answer. So we want to use the validation method. If someone says, well, you know, going to one of those you know, community, that scares me. Instead of a response of a caregiver going, oh, there's nothing to fear. Why would you be scared? Many people do that. Like, you know, the neighbor next door did it. They weren't scared. You shouldn't either. We can't go that route because that's not validating the fear that they just brought up to us. So if we use the validation method, really how we would handle that is to say, okay, thank you for telling me that. What part of that? makes you fearful and listen to the specific reason why they fear, right? So I can't, I can't direct an answer until I really know what their, what their fear is. And validation is the way that we do it. We 
We say, okay, I understand what you're saying. Now tell me more. If you're having a hard time with the conversation and perhaps your senior is not opening up to you, and maybe this isn't new, maybe the relationship that you have, not everybody has the perfect relationship with their senior, right? So maybe there's someone better to take the conversation to the next level, right? And if so, call on the next person to come in and take over in gathering information. One of the things that uh, I think every, well, I shouldn't say everybody, I would say a high number of people struggle with is uh, when should a senior stop driving? Now, if you were all in front of me, I would say, what does everybody think if we just said, all right, 80 years old and you're done? Hey, there'd be some people that would go, oh yeah, you know, that's a good rule. But the fact is, no two seniors are alike. There are some 74 year olds that, you know, are, are still mountain climbing. So we can't really draw a conclusion as to when a senior should stop driving. We know that there are statistics on both sides, right? So if you look at a senior, they are less likely to have a DUI, a DWI. Very few of them still drive at night. They don't go far, right? They will maybe go to their child's house or adult child's house or maybe to the same restaurant time after time. They typically will not text while they're driving. And as far as like the emergency room statistics, there's no evidence that in the emergency room, more seniors are seen because of accidents. That's one side. On the other side is by the time we are 60 years old, most people are taking some sort of a supplement, a vitamin, medication. Uh, maybe they have started with arthritis or you know, they have some joint stiffness. Uh, they're not as agile as they used to be. Perhaps they drive their older car and it doesn't have the high level of technology that cars do now. So maybe it's vision, right? So when you look at vision, I mean, as we age, just normal aging, our vision changes, right? So something like uh, glycome. Glycome is fairly uh, popular. There's 2.7 million people that are over 40 years old that have glycoma. And if you can see my picture here uh, over in the corner of your screen, I'm gonna put on a pair of glasses that will show you the vision allowance for glycoma, right? So now I have center vision, but I don't have any peripheral vision. This would be very dangerous for me to get behind a wheel. Even if it's not glycoma, let's just look at something like uh, cataracts. You know, as we get older, especially after uh, 60 years old, nearly every single person will at some point have cataracts. Some people get them removed, but not everybody. And if you want to just kind of see what does it look like to have cataracts, just take a pair of glasses, take some uh, Vaseline, uh, or you know some sort of a, a clear gel and put them on the, the lenses. And that would give you a good indication of what it would look like to have cataracts. Hearing, hearing loss is a factor, right? So when we are looking at hearing loss, 25% um, of people between the ages of 65 and 74 have lost their hearing. And if you go past 74, so let's go past 75, 50% of seniors have some level of hearing loss. We also know that there is a correlation between hearing loss or sight loss with the ability to remain cognitively healthy, right? So all of that makes a difference when you're looking at someone who wants to maintain their freedom. I mean, when we got our license, that was kind of the uh, way that we felt like an adult. We, we can drive now. So if that's the truth and that's the way we felt, then if you take away a license, then is the opposite true? Do we feel as though now we're being treated like a child? So instead of saying, okay, listen, you can't drive anymore. 
I mean, this is clear, you, you just can't drive it anymore. One of the things that we have to look at is how does this person, your person, how do, how do they see their driving? Like if they stop driving, does that mean they, they can't go see their friends or they can't go out to eat? Or what kind of restrictions in life does that mean? So we have to make sure that while we might be saying and suggesting to take away you know, uh, the right to drive, in place of that, how do I maintain this senior in their daily routines and their social activities? And so it takes some investigation on a caregiver's part to say, listen, you know, we'll make it work. We'll find a way to get you to these places, but I am concerned because your prescription and your glasses has just gotten a little bit thicker and you know, we want to maintain your safe. And there's also the other part too, which is the, the you know, any, anyone who would drive with the senior. So it's the senior's safety, absolutely. But it's also any passenger safety. Not to mention anyone else, of course, driving driving on, on the street. So there's a lot to think about. It's not just a matter of, okay, it's time. There are a few uh, states that actually leave this up to the medical team, right? So a person's doctor uh, would have the right to take away their, their license. But in those states, when they investigated, they didn't see any benefit. Like I said, the emergency rooms couldn't give them a report that you know, showed that there were any less accidents in that state because they have that rule. And so other states didn't follow. And oftentimes doctors don't wanna get involved anyway because they have built the relationship with their patient and they don't wanna be the bad guy. So they don't always get involved in, in decisions about driving. So my suggestion is, look at the car, are there any dents, maybe drive with the senior uh, and you know, just kind of use your own judgment. But if you feel that you would not put your own children in there, that is one way that we can say, okay, now it's time for that conversation. But when you go in for that conversation, make sure you have your, we will replace your driving with other methods of transportation. And while we're evaluating, it's also wise to evaluate physical, social, and the cognitive ability of your senior, right? So when we're looking at uh, no two people are alike, right? You met one person, you've met one. Everybody's got different levels, like I mentioned. So when you're evaluating, uh, one, what about hygiene? Is your person, uh, is your senior, are they able to bathe on their own? Are they willing to bathe? Right? And sometimes we see that as they age, they are less likely to bathe. Now, does a senior need to bathe every day? No, twice, three times a week, yes. But we have to make sure that they have the ability to bathe, which means getting in and out of a shower or a bath. Uh, if the bath is upstairs, getting up those stairs to get into the bath and so forth. So they need to be able to climb stairs. Can they dress on their own? Now, it doesn't mean, are their clothes matching? I don't care about that, but can they dress on their own? Can they put their foot into their pant leg, right? Can they stretch their arms to get into their shirts? Are, there, are they able to you know, uh, get themselves in and out of their clothing? Can they prepare their meals? Are there limitations to the preparations of their meals? Can they get in and out of their bed, right? Can they clean their home? You know, is their home being maintained? Uh, are they able to, you know, toilet themselves without any help? Social activities, you know, social, if we have learned anything from the pande pandemic, we learned that social engagement and face-to-face -face contact is extremely important. So. Is your senior, are they able right now to maintain the level of social activity that they are accustomed to? Or are you watching your seniors start to withdraw? Are they maybe not attending activities anymore? And because of that, you see a change in social character, right? 
is very important. We, you know, I've got people that are fine driving if they could only get to their cars, but there are three stairs from the, you know, their, their door to the ground level of their home and they can't get down those three stairs. And then cognitively, to evaluate cognitively, are, are they, your senior, are they aging a normal aging process, right? And normal aging process, so what is that? Well, honestly, what that means is that uh, by the time, like I said, we're 60, we're all probably taking something, you know, either it's a, a variety of medications, uh, maybe high blood pressure or, or uh, maybe diabetes or anxiety or whatever that is, or maybe it's none of those. However, we are taking all of our vitamins. And by the way, I just went ahead and bought some ginkgo biloba because I heard that really helped. And it's all over the counter. Well, are these medications showing any side effects? And you want to look at that. That's normal aging, right? Side effect. Normal aging. I mentioned about the eyesight. Normal aging. We lose 10% of our memory, right? We maybe struggle to remember a word. We later remember it, but initially we don't. I mean, I've had lunch with what's her name. I don't know how many times, right? Later on, I'm like, oh gosh, I can't believe I forgot Mary's name. But as we get older, that that is that is normal aging. There are parts of us that we just can't, uh, we can't change. Uh, normal aging, I mentioned about the eyesight and so forth. Uh, depth perception, that's part of normal aging. Where, you know, all of a sudden the difference between two colors, maybe a, a light tile next to a dark uh, carpet in a home. Well, our, as a age, uh, the eye ages, you may see that, they may see that as two different levels. One way you can tell if that's how they're looking at it is they may put one of their feet out first and just kind of tap the floor ahead of them just to make sure, right? That it is, you know, it is not any higher or lower because they're avoiding a fall. But, you know, evaluate their current. Where are they in, in these three areas? One of the things that is very deceiving is the first presentation of dementia. So I want to just take a couple of minutes and go through what you might see in the first presentation of dementia, right? So obviously, most people would be well aware of a short-term memory loss. Boy, mom's just not remembering. She didn't even remember breakfast this morning, right? But at the same time, while maybe one of you notices mom's memory is, her short-term memory is lacking, well, then maybe other uh, caregivers on your caregiver team, maybe a sibling and so forth, that would go, oh, I don't notice that. I think mom's doing absolutely fine. No, I, I, don't, I, I don't see that at all. So you might have some people noticing a memory issue and other people just absolutely don't see it. However, in many of the non-reversible dementias, that is the first presentation. It comes up, it goes, it comes. It's very deceiving. As a matter of fact, I can remember saying to Bob when he was at the first presentation of dementia, I, I would say, why do you act one way in front of some people and you act totally different in front of me? Because it was almost like, I, I almost thought he was doing it on purpose, which, which he wasn't. But the beginning stages of dementia can often look that way. Yeah, they struggle to find a word to finish the sentence. It brings on frustration. Maybe concentration, you know, is they have a hard time concentrating. Uh, declining grooming. You may notice that your, your senior, uh, who used to be a, a very polished person, is no longer as polished. And their hygiene is no longer what it used to be. You might see even some personality changes. So from the list that I just gave you, those are all doable. So when a family would get together and they'd say, well, I'm seeing these things, probably none of them would be a shock. But what surprises a lot of people 
is that at this time in the beginning stages, the onset of non-reversible dementias, the part that really gets us is the change in logic and we're not expecting it. I don't know anybody that expected the change in logic, right? So we were all born with logic. I mean, we're wired for logic, uh, which is why uh, you know, we use that logic to problem solve. And, and some people say life is nothing but millions of problems that we solve every day, every minute of our lives. And people that have onset of dementia, uh, they don't lose that ability to problem solve. But what they do is they use their new form of logic to solve their problems. I'll give you a couple of examples, real examples. So we had a caregiver who was watching her dad. This was regular. She would go pick him up from his house, bring him to her house, and he had his own chair, and he would watch his favorite TV shows on her large screen TV. He was watching Bonanza. Very popular for seniors, right? Watching Bonanza, large screen TV, and the barn went up in flames on the show. Her dad gets up and he runs to the kitchen. He gets a bucket of water. He comes back and he douses the TV. Now the daughter comes in and she responds the way most of us would respond, which is, hey, dad, what are you doing? Oh, my gosh, look at the TV. Oh, my carpet, it's sopping wet. And dad says, why are you mad at me? I just saved all those people. The logic changes, right? We had uh, another lady who her kids would leave, uh, come over daily and give her her meals, but they had her in her, in her home. That was their long-term decision. The first uh, of the adult children came over to give her her breakfast didn't see her, called her out, said, hey, mom, where are you? Mom says, I'm in the bathroom. She says, okay, I'm gonna leave your breakfast on the counter, I'll call you later, and she leaves. The second adult child comes over with lunch, doesn't see her mom, where are you? Mom says, I'm in the bathroom. She says, okay, I'm gonna leave your lunch on the table, I'll call you later, they leave. The third person in the family, they had 11 kids. A third person came by, didn't see mom, called out, where are you? Mom says, I'm in the bathroom. And this third person, Mary, went over, knocked on the door and said, may I come in? Her mother said, yes. She opened the door and found her mom had fallen in the tub the day before. Now the family gets together and they say, why didn't she say she needed help? She knew we were there. We said, mom, where are you? And she answered, why wouldn't she have said, help, hurry, come here. I said, well, you didn't ask her. First presentation of dementia, communication changes. Caregivers, you need to ask the for the answer that you need, right? Mom, are you okay? Mom, do you need help? And typically I encourage people to ask questions that have choices, yes or no, right? Are you hot? Yes or no. Are you cold? Yes or no, right? Do you wanna wear this or this? So, and it makes communication so much more clear. But that's the first present of, uh, presentation of dementia. And many families start making decisions at this point in time for their senior, right? And like I said, no two people are alike. So there are a lot of decisions to be made. When it comes to a routine, look at the routine that your senior has currently, right? Look at the routines over a period of time. Are their routines changing? You know, routines are healthy. They're healthy for you. They're healthy, healthy for me, right? It reduces the need to plan. It allows people to have healthy habits. Um, we can feel like we're accomplished when we get through our items on our routine. Um, and we know people that lack a routine, they tend to carry with them more stress. So routines are very important. Look at that routine, you know, like, are they using any form of energy? Like on my screen, I use the word exercise and maybe that's the wrong word because sometimes, you know, our aging seniors don't want to exercise. So they don't even like the word. And so I will exchange that word exercise for energize, right? Is there 15 minutes 
in their day that they actually use energy, whether it's walking up and down the stairs, taking a short walk outside, maybe in the yard. Uh, perhaps they have some sort of a exercise, there's the word, but routine that they've grown accustomed to. Perhaps they go to a senior center where they do some sort of maybe chair aerobic or, or so forth. There's all kinds of programs. But you want to look and make sure, is this a balanced routine that is keeping them healthy? What about family and friends, right? Are they able to visit family and friends? And for those that are in rural areas, as we get older, sometimes family and friends find it harder and harder to come out for visits. So now do we have someone who is lacking in a routine because their ability to get out and see family and friends uh, is it like it used to be? And yet family and friends aren't always coming over to them, but we need to make sure that they have that activity. What about medications? So far, do they take their own medication? And if not, how are we going to maintain those medications in the future? Let me tell you, go back to vision, right? So there is something in normal aging called yellowing of the lens where as we get older, if we're blessed to have a long, long life, the, our eye lens will change to yellow. So white is not necessarily white anymore. So if their routine was to take the white pill at noon, and yet now that white pill is looking more like yellow, they may not be taking those medications because they want to follow instructions, but this is outside the instruction that they have. So look at that bathing. Are they bathing on the days? Maybe their bath day or Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Are they maintaining that? I have a, a gentleman who contacted me, his dad's living in his own home. The gentleman's responsibility is to stop by periodically and check on his dad who's aging. And uh, he called and we were going through some caregiving uh, ideas and activities and so forth. And I asked him about this. I said, how is his routine? And he said, well, actually he does pretty good. And I said, great. He, I said, is there anything that you find in the routine that is either lacking or questionable? And he said, you know, Jill, the only thing would be bathing, which is quite common. And I said, okay. So when, uh, when was the last time your dad bathed? And his answer was, well, gosh, it's got to be at least a year ago. And I said, oh, that's, that's not good. I said, well, he, he must have a, an odor, right? And he says, no, actually, he doesn't. If it weren't for his hair, you would never know, which means he hadn't shampooed his hair either. And I said, okay, that right there is a signal, right, that you need assistance. I said, either you can get your dad in the shower and he said, Jill, I don't have that kind of relationship with my dad. Hey, I don't judge. That's, I, I totally understand. If you can't do it, then you have to get someone in who can help because that is part of a healthy routine. 76% of seniors want to age at home. I'm sure no one is surprised at this, right? We want to stay at home. That sounds like a great idea. But in the United States, 1% of homes are safe for seniors. One. It's very small. So they want to stay home because obviously moving is stressful and they might feel that they're losing their independence and, uh, you know, they've got emotional ties. They've been in this home for years and years and this is where they are and this is where they want to stay. But as a caregiver or as a family who are united in making sure that uh, your senior maintains safety, you have to look at what happens at home, right? Saying, if we say, oh, okay, you're, we'll stay home. I, ideally, that, that sounds terrific, but it's just not that simple. 55% of falls are in the home. 25% are at the home, but outside. And the death of this senior, the number one, are falls. 
So that, you know, the statistics don't lie. So we look at this with, okay, well, you know, we have to look at them if they are wanting to stay home, if it is a place that we can maintain the safety and security uh, while offering, you know, a healthy routines, well, that, that's what we, sh we could do, right? So let's just go through the home. Bathroom, number one place, 80% of falls are going to happen in the bathroom. So what we need, grab bars, number one. Not towel racks, right? Towel racks are not grab bars. So make sure you have grab bars over by the, the toilet, in the shower, obviously walk-in showers seem to be far better than the tubs. And, but if you need a tub, then you get the chair that goes over that where the, the senior can sit on the chair and slide into the tub. Look at how they're able to, to grab the shower head, right? We don't want the tall shower head. We need the, the shower head that is handheld, right? So it's at their eye level. So they can take it and they can shower. Make sure that you have no slip uh, bath inside your tub, mats, and outside your tub, right? And in very thin ones so they don't trip on it. Look for the toilet seat risers. They've got, well, the one in the picture here where they actually can pull themselves up and set themselves down. I highly suggest you get rid of the locks on the doors. If there is a fall, then you're able to get in without having to break down the door. So tubs or bathrooms, you know, this is this is a, a big change for a lot of people. Even so much as look at the temperature in the, on the water tank, on the hot water tank, right? So as we get older and our skin changes, we're actually able to take on much hotter water. And sometimes it's so hot, we don't realize that it could scald the skin. Highly suggested that you change the temperature of the water to somewhere between 110 and 120 and no hotter than that. We spend approximately, or seniors spend approximately 30 minutes a day in a bathroom. So 30 minutes, a lot can happen in 30 minutes. Right, so go through and make sure that you have even uh, lighting. So uh, motion lights wouldn't be a bad idea. Where they walk in the bathroom, they don't have to look to you know to turn on the light. It automatically comes on. Kitchen. Seniors will spend approximately forty-three minutes a day in their kitchen. Watch them in their kitchen. No more do we need, oh, I'll get a step stool and I'll go up to that third shelf. If the item on the third shelf is something that we're gonna use, we need to bring, bring that item down to a level where they no longer need that step stool. Look for smoke detectors, make sure that they are working. Make sure that uh, a, um, a fire extinguisher is easy to access and they know how to use it. Adjust the stock, whether it's groceries or canned goods, refrigerator items, you know, so that they are easy to access. Watch for items that are over a stove. Sometimes I see people that are reaching over a stove to get their item. We shouldn't have anything over a stove. Find timers that will automatically turn off things like toasters or uh, air fryers or toaster ovens, right? With an auto shut off. So, you know, like an iron, they did that years ago, but you know, maybe your, your senior says, well, you know, I wanna stay at home, but I won't cook anymore. I'll just use the microwave, right? So maybe there's some way that you can prepare their meals prepared so they don't have to use, uh, you know, the stove and so forth. But be very careful of the kitchen because a lot can happen in there. Watch the floors. You know, there again, we spill something, it becomes slippery and, and easy to fall. So back to uh, uh, other areas in the home, bedrooms. 
Watch for clothes on the floor. Watch for rugs. Get rid of rugs, right? We don't even need rugs. It's just clutter and easy to, to trip over. Look for lamps that have pull chains on it. In fact, a lot of lamps will have the phone plug-ins now, right? So your loved one, if they use a cell phone, which technology-wise, we have, uh, gosh, 53% of seniors are now using a smartphone. So if you want them to have that smartphone next to the bed with them, uh, and that's something they want to, and you want to plug in, have them plug right next to in the lamp that allows them to, you know, to, to use that. Uh, make sure that you have those motion lights, especially for in the middle of the night, because what we know is in the middle of the night when someone gets the urge and they have to go to the bathroom, they may jump out of bed a little quicker than any other time and start heading out the door to the bathroom. Have those motion lights so that they automatically go on. Your loved one doesn't have to struggle to find the lamp, to turn it on, to have a safe journey to the, to the bathroom. Make sure, watch them to get in and out of their bed, right? Do you maybe need to get a new bed frame that's maybe a little lower to the ground so that they can easily get in and out? Look at your st stairways if you have them, right? So while stairways have typically one handrail, I highly suggest that you do handrails on both sides, right? Give that extra support of those of those handrails. If you have hardwood floors, consider putting the non-slip uh, runners to, to grab their, their footing, right? Especially if your senior wears slippers or something with the, the sole being so slippery. But these are air areas, again, light up the, the hallways with the motion lamps. Uh, know your neighborhood. So I mentioned to you majority of falls happen in the house uh, with some happening outside. Uh, but we also wanna make sure that we understand the neighborhood. And you might say, well, yeah, I live there myself. I know that neighborhood. But what I mean by that is watch your senior, watch where they go. We are human beings, which means we form habits. And so if your senior says, oh, I'm getting my exercise, I go for a walk every day. Find out where that walk is. How long does it take them to get from their front door to maybe a busy street or maybe a, a canal of water or whatever other danger zones could potentially show themselves in this neighborhood? It's also good to get to know the neighbors, right? And let them know, hey, listen, here's my phone number in case you know, you see mom outside, she likes to take a walk uh, most days. If you ever come across my mother and here's my phone number. So let them know that you can, you know, you can be called. Um, medical care alert system, obviously they're sponsoring this. And uh, and I was talking to, to Brian before everyone got on. I said, I'm, you know, to this system in particular, it's kind of like I've gone full circle because when I was caregiving for Bob and I had to go to work, right? I had no choice. We had two small kids, you know, he was he was uh, sick very young. So our kids, Bethany and Jacob, uh, they were only four and five years old when he was initially diagnosed with the lung cancer and the brain cancer. Well, the last thing I could do is go without a job. So I had to leave every day and I had to go to work. Beth and Jake at four and five years old uh, would be left with their dad, who at that point, he was cognitively okay, physically not okay. And so I went ahead and I installed medical care alert system. This is well before I became the voice of the caregiver, or opened my business. I don't know what I would have done without them. And I'll tell you, if we used it once, we used it well over a hundred times. And when I say use it, I mean press a button. And that's as simple as it was. If the kids saw their dad was going into a seizure, which happened a lot, 
They knew to press the button. The person on the other end knew their names and they would say, hi, you know, this is Michelle. Am I talking to Bethany or Jacob? And they would talk and say, you know, this is Jacob and, you know, my dad's on the ground. But, and this person stayed with them the entire time, obviously calling me right away. In some cases, we had to call an ambulance too. But I kept this alert system. It was helpful, not just to Bethany and Jacob and to Bob, but it gave me peace of mind. At least I have put something in place. I can't always be there. And yet emergency needs are there no matter if I can be there or not. So the peace of mind I had was, I, I can't even tell you, it was immeasurable. So I'm honored to actually be delivering this topic uh, with, with uh, you know, Medical Care Alert System sponsoring. I used the system again uh, a year and a half ago. My sister had spinal surgery and she lives on her own. She's very active and very healthy. But her spinal surgery, she could either come live with one of us sisters, you know, while she got on her feet, which she refused. She said, nope, I wanna go home. And we said, okay, well, the only way you can go home is if we have the system placed in your home. So for 90 days, she had medical care alert system. Initially, she was like, oh, you guys are silly. I don't need it. But ultimately, it gave her a great feeling. And as a sister, it gave me peace of mind knowing that she had the system. Another thing you could do uh, is take your loved ones a sock, a used stinky sock, and a current picture. Put it in a Ziploc bag and keep it. In the event your loved one does leave the home and you can't find them, whether it's a case of uh, you know, a cognitive issue or they fall and they can't get back home and you do call uh, police or 911, you can hand them the Ziploc bag and they would be able to have their uh, photo, a current photo and be able to follow the scent with, that, with the sock. So it's easier to find the loved one. Common questions for home care, you know, okay. Do we bring in a third party? There are a lot of third party care providers, companies, right? And um, how do I know if you need one? Well, ask, are they maintaining their home? Is it clean? All right, what about their car? You know, are they able to maintain their lifestyle? Things that we went through a little bit. Look at their personal appearance, their hygiene. Can they do their laundry? Are they wearing clean clothes? You know, I, when it says, are they wearing the same clothes? I don't care if they're wearing the same clothes. They may wear the same clothes day after day after day after day. And they may not even match anymore. As long as they're clean, who cares? Don't sweat the small stuff. But in some cases, like the gentleman who didn't bathe his dad and couldn't, then it's time to bring in a third care person. And there are good companies out there that do background checks and investigations and so forth. My initial third party, when I hired a third party, I hired a lady from a newspaper and I made a mistake. I met her, she seemed kind, she lived on a farm. I thought that meant something, she seemed very pure. Uh, you know, she she sent us all kinds of prayer cards. So, you know, she she seemed um, you know religious and, and moral and, and legal and so forth. But it didn't end up to be that way. Thirty days in, she was fine. Sixty days in, we saw a difference. By ninety days, we recognized that she was sedating Bob during the day, and then he was up all night. So, my suggestion is that you look into a third party care company. And, and find out, you know, maybe your, your loved one just needs two hours a week. Maybe that's all. Maybe they need help with paperwork. Maybe they need help with house cleaning. Maybe they need help with just showering. Maybe they just need social conversation. You could do that too. I need somebody to come over and stay with my dad and keep him active. Terrific. Take him for a walk. Terrific. It doesn't have to be medical. It could be very much 
I need a third party because I can't always be there. It's also good as a caregiver to make sure you have time away, right? Because although that's another class, caregivers get burned out. So this gives you some relief. Common reasons to relocate. I mentioned to you in 2011, Obama made everybody go ahead and submit their plans state by state and all territories. And when this happened, we saw these buildings just kind of pop up overnight. And believe me, they have some gorgeous buildings out there, right? With the beautiful waterfalls and movie theaters and uh, pubs and so forth, they're gorgeous. They're not for everybody, but they're for some. Those that choose to go there, well, there are some advantages. There's no home maintenance. You don't have to cook for yourself. You don't have to worry about going up and down the stairs, right? You don't have to worry about loneliness. There are activities going on all the time. And so this kind of replaces a lot of that, uh, you know, which at home, it can get lonely. Yeah, I want to stay in my home. I've been here 55 years, but I like my home better when everybody lived here. So loneliness, isolation, all of that can be very dangerous. So loved ones don't stress so much. They don't worry so much. If they know their loved ones are in a community where they're being taken care of. Now, the one thing you might think of is, well, no, 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 I'm not doing that because you know, there's a lot of abuse in those places. So I need to set the story straight. There is more abuse in private homes than there are in communities. We don't often hear that, but that's a truth. So if we look at you know just data, there were 50,000 reports of abuse in a nursing home versus 236,000. So it's like a quarter of the reports actually come from the communities. And I, uh, although I teach uh, how to spot elder abuse uh, in in you know for caregivers, especially families, I often find that. People really don't know what qualifies for abuse. Being a caregiver is hard work. It's very hard work and it can be exhausting. And with the population that is out there right now, what we find is that there are so many seniors, right? Highest number that we've ever counted in the US census. And there, we have a lack of population in the senior care age group. So what happens is you might have, oh, back when I was actively caregiving for Bob, you would have, oh, Mary and John and Jeffrey all sharing responsibility for their mom. And because 70% of caregivers still work, well, they could maintain their jobs and they could maintain the tasks of taking care of their mom without too much impact on their own lives. But when our population shifted about eight years ago and the boomers came with such a large population, what we see now, we see Mary, who's now in charge of her aging mom, her aging dad, and dad's sister, Aunt Betty. Now we have one caregiver and multiple patients which brings a lot of stress. And I often think that that level of stress brings in things like yelling and uh, you know, change in tone and argument and, and maybe trying to hold your, your loved one in a chair. And so all of a sudden you have you know, physical abuse and people are at their max, right? Uh, we have seniors that live in rural areas and they are not visited often. So it's easy to hide that kind of thing. A lot of times seniors don't wanna talk about it because they're afraid. If they bring it up, maybe no one will believe them, but also if they bring it up, then, then what's gonna happen? Then they may put me in the hook. I better just be happy with what I have. So. My point to this slide is to recognize 60% of abuse comes from family, loving families. The majority of it is spouse and adult children. So keep an eye on, on your loved one, right? And get help because there it is stressful. 
And we do lose our patience because we are human beings and it happens. And I'm not saying abuse should happen, it shouldn't. But we need to know what qualifies for abuse, how we can get keep ourselves uh, to maintain a level of patience. And we can do that oftentimes by bringing in assistance, having a plan for ourselves to allow us to kind of recharge. So we're not over exhausted, we're not overextending ourselves and, and we're taking care of not just our patient, but ourselves as caregivers also. And then finally, often a difficult decision is end of life discussion. And the best way to put this is we don't wanna guess. We don't wanna guess at the end of life what our person would have wanted. And I remember going through this. At 41 years old, I sat down because I needed to know. We didn't think Bob would live to the end of the year. And we had never talked about this before. And I, the only way I could bring it up to him was to say to him, hey, Bob, I want to tell you what I want at the end of life. I want to fill out a living will because I don't want to leave you with that decision. And so would you do that for me too? Because I want to do that for you. And we sat down and we wrote all our instructions at the same time, at the same table and had that discussion. And he was willing and I was very grateful because when the time came and I got the call that Bob had entered into this circle of seizures, they said, what do you want us to do? And over the phone, I said, do you have his living will in front of you? And they said, we do, but I still had the right, because living will is not a legal document in Michigan. I still had the right to step in and say, no, don't listen to that living will. I want to tell you what to do. And I didn't. I said, no, we had this discussion. You follow his instructions. And, and Bob died um, October 27th, 12 years ago. And I have a sense of peace because they followed his instructions, not mine. You know, if you're, if you're the caregiver for a parent uh, or you are a parent, and you think of it this way, our parent parental obligation is to teach our kids and take care of our kids and guide them, right? And we did that. We taught them how to walk and talk and all these things that we did. But on the worst day of their life, we sometimes leave them without instructions and, and it's not fair. When should we have this discussion? Right away. You can always change your instructions throughout life, but leave instructions and have that conversation with your loved one. I, um, I'm going to stop sharing here. And uh, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions or, or comments, um, please feel free. Uh, I would be happy to, to give you answers. Uh, there's a couple ways we can do it. One, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, or if you prefer not to, you can send your question in and uh, along with your request for the presentation if you want. And I can get back to you one-on-one -on -one if it's a private question that you'd rather not ask. Uh, however you want to... Uh, ask it, I'm happy to answer. Uh, Brian, you're muted. Thank you. Um, Joe, we got a couple of questions. Um, okay. and we've had a number of people send in emails requesting the presentation. So uh, again, anyone that wants the presentation, uh, which you did a phenomenal job, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> email for that is sales at medicalcarealert.com. So it's three words, medicalcarealert.com. Care is our middle name, as we like to say. Um, but we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one was asking about uh, strategies for a senior who is stubborn about getting an evaluation or considering a medication that could help. So what, what would be some uh, strategies for for someone who's stubborn or doesn't want to get an evaluation or doesn't want to consider taking any kind of medication? 
a okay. caregiver. So, you about? know, that it, that's probably a loaded question. So, uh, stubborn, we have a lot of stubborn seniors, actually. Uh, that's quite common. So, the I don't want an evaluation. I'm going to assume that means a cognitive evaluation, but I am just guessing. So, when it comes to evaluation, uh, not everybody gets evaluated. Not everybody gets uh, identified as having, and, and I'm gonna use dementia because th this is probably leading towards that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think there's only 45% of uh, the seniors that will be diagnosed with, with dementia. So there's a number of people that go without that diagnosis. Uh, doctors aren't always uh, convinced and so, you know, and there are a lot of families that will say, hey, look, Aunt Lucy was like this, so that must be what mom has. I don't need to take her. This is a loaded question, so I, I, I almost want to talk to you one on one. But the, the uh, suggestion is I would watch the behaviors. There are two things that come to mind here. One, there is something called a non-reversible dementia, right? So you would find non-reversible reversible dementias to be Lewy body, frontal lobe, Alzheimer's. Um, they have something called a mixed dementia. And doctors are even putting out general dementia right now. And that means when you get it, you get it, you got it, you can't uh, ever not have it. You'll always have it. But there's also something called a pseudo-dementia. And that's where the benefit would be for your patient or your person to be evaluated because if they have an imbalanced thyroid, it could look like dementia. If they have loss of hearing or vision and it's bringing cognitive decline, once that's, uh, they recover their hearing or eyesight, that would bring them back to cognitive clearance, but it looks like dementia. Uh, UTIs, definitely urinary tract infection can look like dementia. So there are a lot of things that, you know, your loved one may say, I don't want to be evaluated for that. So maybe you turn it to say, let's have you, uh, would you be willing to go to the doctor? Let's just test for a UTI. You know, urinary tract infection is very common, especially with elders who wear adult briefs, right? And maybe don't bathe nearly as often as they used to. Um, it could also be if they had surgery and they had anesthesia even from a dental office. Anesthesia, the older we get, the harder it is to get out of our system. And it can look like the onset of dementia. So there are a whole bunch of what we call pseudo dementias that going to that doctor would benefit. So I think if nothing else, maybe you say, can we just go test you for a, a UTI? Cause boy, you'll feel a lot better uh, once you, you know, that's gone instead of bringing on the cognitive part. I hope that helped. That was a long answer. No, oh, that's great. That's great. I think it is helpful. Uh, we got some more comments of folks <clears throat> saying that this was a great presentation. They appreciated it. And also asking for, uh, for copies. Uh, another question that kind of came up was uh, related to what about the caregiver? Who's caring for the caregiver? Yeah, isn't that the question? So there are 65 million caregivers right now, right? Uh, it is a high risk position. We don't apply for it. It usually gets handed down, right? Or to the last man standing. And, and I say that because that is typically how it goes. The person that is caring for the caregiver is the caregiver. So on top of everything else you have, everything else you have, and I know it's a lot. You have got to maintain time, social activity for yourself. And, and I know right now people are going, what do you mean time? I have no time. This is what I, I do. So I, I facilitate a number of, of support groups. And I ask at every single support group the same question. I want you to ask yourself privately, what percentage of today, and you're going to ask yourself every day, so let's start with today. What percentage of today has been set, uh, spent on yourself? Now, the most common answer I get 
is zero. I haven't spent any time on me. And that's when you know you're in a danger zone, right? There is such a thing as caregiver burnout. It is real, it is high risk. 30% of caregivers who are caring for someone with cognitive decline will die before their patient because of the level of stress. So take that zero and you got to start looking at it going, okay, I'm going to spend 15 minutes a day on me at the start, All right? 15 minutes. I am, and, and, and maybe we can do caregiving survival class uh, one day and I can teach you how to grow that program. I read that statistic uh, when I was caring for, for Bob. And of course the kids are young and Bob's dependent upon me. Before you know it, I had two jobs and him. And I thought that statistic had my name all over it. I, I really thought I was gonna go before him. I, I just thought I can't, I have got to survive this. And that's when I published a uh, personal position for the caregiver. That was my survival story. And, uh, it, you know, believe it or not, it, it's still uh, the number one class in Michigan. But the idea of behind it is you have to get yourself on that grid of or spending a, a period of time, percentage of time on you. You have to. Who takes care of the caregiver? You take care of the caregiver. But then you got to take care of yourself. Jill, I think you summed it up perfectly right there. We should probably end on that note because that okay. uh, that that is you know that is that is key. And and caregiver burnout is a huge issue that we see everybody dealing with. When we get calls from families, they're stressed. You know, they got a thousand things going on and we, you know, we hear it in their voice, you know, and they, and they want to get a medical alert system. And a lot of times they're hoping it'll do a lot more than it really can. You know, if somebody's a wanderer, for example, it's like, well, it'll only work for them if they're going to actually wear it. So we really can't count on that if that's your, if that's the deal you're, situ you're, you're dealing with. So it's really important that we, you know, that the caregivers, they're so stressed. They don't know where to start. The information resources are so hard to find. And so, you know, the more that we can be kind to each other and really support each other, uh, get yourself a, a group, find other people who are dealing with the same thing because they've, they've fought a lot of these same battles that you're fighting right now and they can give you the benefit of their experience. Uh, it's really important. And, and I want to add one thing that you just brought up, Brian, that uh, maybe some on this call are experiencing. And that is that, what we see now, because people live longer, we get seniors living with seniors. So we have mom who, you know, has some uh, vision issues, right? So she, and, and she's on a walker, but uh, cognitively she's healthier than dad. And so they're gonna live together. And that's hard, right? That is high risk. So where, you know, your device, a medical care alert uh, device, that gives, both of them a third party, right? Yeah. Mom can't pick dad up if he falls, but she can press that button in a heartbeat. And we yeah. have a lot of seniors taking care of seniors right now. Well, Jill, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time and educating everybody. Uh, I, I'm looking at the attendance and uh, People, people hung in here through the, through the whole thing. So this is a, obviously a, a really important topic to people and, and you've obviously added a lot of value. So thank you again for everything you've done for, for everyone. My pleasure. Here. Thank you for sponsoring and uh, I wish everyone the best. You're always in my thoughts, always. Okay. And uh, again, sales at medicalcarealert.com. If you'd like a copy of the, uh, of the presentation, we're happy to get it for you. Okay. Thanks, Brian. All right. Bye, Jeff. Bye.